Let's talk about how to submit better auditions. You're a voice actor. You're an entrepreneur. You're a VOpreneur. Welcome to the Everyday VOpreneur Podcast, your guide through the business of voiceover. You have a great website, right? Well, make sure you host it at some place that doesn't suck. Hey, it's Brad Newman, fellow VO pro for 28 years and owner of UpperLevelHosting.com. People ask why us, and that's simple. We make it easy, respect your time, save you money, and just make all the magic happen. You don't need to know all the tech stuff when it comes to hosting your website. We got you. Ask around tens of thousands of client interactions later and six years of amazing customer service and not a single negative complaint ever. UpperLevelHosting.com The VOpreneur Podcast. Hey, it doesn't suck. Not as funny as Conan. Not as cute as Seth Meyers. Not as smart as Colbert. But he's one of us, and that counts for something. Here's Mark Scott, the original Everyday VOpreneur. Hello and welcome to the Everyday VOpreneur podcast, your guide through the business of voiceover. I'm Mark Scott, the original Everyday VOpreneur, back with another episode filled with actionable, practical advice that is going to help you grow your voiceover business. Hey, if you've been listening and enjoying the podcast, why don't you do me one quick favor and share it in your Instagram stories. Go online, post a picture of you listening, post a picture of your favorite episode, share a quick video, something in your Instagram stories, and tag me at Mark Scott. I'd love to see it. It's really encouraging for me. So tag me in your stories at Mark Scott. So auditioning is a big part of the job for voice actors. And if you want to grow your business, you have to be great at auditioning. And one of the places where a lot of voice actors are submitting their auditions is online casting. Are there specific strategies that can help you to improve not only your online casting auditions, but just your auditions in general? Yes, there are. And my guest today is going to help you identify some of those tips and tricks to get just a little bit better. One could argue that the job of a voice actor is auditioning. The more that we do that job, the better we are at that job, the more opportunities we'll have, the more income we'll create. So it stands to reason that if we're investing time and energy learning how to deliver great performances, how to have broadcast quality audio, and how to market ourselves effectively, we should also be investing in the craft of auditioning. My guest today has figured out how to master the art of auditioning, and now he's helping other voice actors do the same. He's an award-winning talent himself with an extensive list of credits, including Pepsi Max, Ram Trucks, and Medicare, and a wide range of characters, including Santa Claus. Welcome oh. to the show, Brad Highland. Oh, oh, oh. yeah, <laughs> Santa. Everybody S- says, "What do I? What have I heard you? Oh, you're a voice actor. What have I heard you? Well, um, let me think. Not the Eurolift commercial. Not that. Not that. Oh, Santa. Oh, I hate that elf on the shelf thing. <laughs> so that is yep. so much better than when I say, unless you have done internal employee training for some obscure company that nobody's ever heard of. I'm like, yeah, you've never heard me do anything. So. <laughs> you got to tell us a little bit about Santa, though. Talk talk to us a little bit about that role and how that came about. Um, I, my agent in Atlanta, um, I put my profile together and um, they said, hey, you sing, right? And I said, yeah, of course I sing. Um, good. Well, I'm going to put you up for a role that might have some singing. And I did an audition and it, it turns out it was for a voice of Santa. I didn't know what Santa at the time. And I had a whole bunch of callbacks and... And then I had a phone call with Shanda, the CEO, and her her um, executive producer, Amy, and they were just interviewing their last five or so picks. And um, I said, well, what What do you need to know? I'm, I'd love to be your Santa. And I still didn't know what it was. And they said, well, we're looking for somebody who can laugh the way we want them to laugh. And so they, they said, we want Santa not to go, ho, ho, ho. We want Santa to laugh like this. And they laughed. And I... I you know, and ho, 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 and they went, yes, that's it. And I said, good, do I have the job? And they were like, oh, um, no, we have four or five people to talk to still, but thank you. And I was like, oh. so, <laughs> <laughs> but they they came back. But hey, it all comes down to the ability to do that one thing, right? And that, that yeah. just goes to show you, sometimes it literally is one specific and random thing that they're looking for that that sets you apart from every other talent. But that's turned out to be a, a pretty cool ongoing thing for you. And that's, uh, I mean, that's a fun legacy to leave behind, I think, too. When when the time comes, everybody's going to go back one day. My kids are all going to be listening to Brad as Santa. I'm going to be like, I know that guy. Wait a minute. 
to look back on. Am I checking out? Are you checking me out? What's going on? <laughs> I'm gonna. I I have a legacy here. It, it's it's kind of cool to be able to have a toy of yourself in your yeah. Studio how many too. voice actors? Six four three hundred pound voice actors are the voice of a doll. It's true. I offer glad tidings and joy with a Christmas time blessing for each girl and boy. Oh, oh yeah, there it is. That <laughs> is that is a pretty cool thing that most of us, again, like I said, uh, you know, unless you've done internal employee training for some random obscure company, you've never heard me. So I, I don't have something cool like that. So that is <laughs> that is really fun. So yeah. as a successful voice actor, a- any successful voice actor has a team of people behind them who has coached them, trained them, mentored them along the way. Talk to us about some of the people who have most deeply impacted and influenced you in helping you to find your voice and, and your place in this industry. Wow, there's a, there is a huge list, and I'm already nervous because I know I'm going to forget to talk about somebody who's incredibly important to me. But um, I go all the way back 35 years ago, 34 years ago for my first training, and the guy that I hooked up with locally here, his name is John Burr. And he wrote a book called The Voiceover Actor's Handbook that's still available, very popular. And he, when he linked up with me, he goes, man, you really can do this. You can make this fly. He's the first one to tell me that. And I trained with him, did did all that stuff, um, got demos. And then that was before home studios and the internet even. And and then life took over. So I had to just put it on the shelf for 30-something years until I came back to it. So he was really... And he was very, very instrumental in having my initial confidence. And then lots of other people, a guy named Shane, who who I talked to early in the day, and he said, man, you can do more voices than I can do. You're way more versatile than I am. You're going to kill it. So I was like, okay, I think I can do this. Um, And then fast forward to reaching, finding J. Michael online and connecting with him and having him be an influence for me and redo all my demos. And I've taken hours and hours and hours of training from him, both one-on-one and in group classes. And he's the kind of guy that no matter where he is in the world, I can ask him a question. And if I get the out of office, it, it never fails. Within an hour or two, it's like, hey, yeah, I'll be, I'll be landing in Zurich in a minute and I'll answer your question, <laughs> whatever it is. He's, he's got, I mean, so many people point to him as the true north of of helping me. He's a big one. Um, There's a whole bunch of people, plus some really top flight training people, including you. I reached out to you, I think in 2017, and you did a one-on-one about uh, booking in your backyard. And and as soon as I finished with that, I started looking and I joined my local uh, um, chamber of commerce. And then within two months, they had asked me to be on and do... um, a cable TV interview with the executive director. I remember that video. I remember watching that on YouTube. Yeah. And um, there's, geez, there's so many people. Plus the top flight, there's so many really top flight um, voiceover coach people. Kay Bass is, I call her my voiceover whisperer. She's amazing. And I continue to stay connected with her. I have one more uh, one-on-one that I can schedule with her. Um, Just so many people. Dave Walsh. There's just everyone that I've, touched i've taken really really important pieces of the puzzle away and i just keep the important thing is you get training you you have to keep that present and in your life you can't get trained and then blow it out of your mind and start with somebody else it's connective tissues and i tell the students that i work with all the time it's little pieces that you put together and let the glue work and get confident and grow from that and then you want you don't want to be the I booked a big job I'm really good oh now I suck and you go down to the bottom and you hate yourself oh I booked another cup now I, you want the you want it to be instead of this big up and down curve you want it to be an eyelash curve you're a stats kind of guy but you know an eyelash curve is you you're good and you learn something oh there's a little hiccup but then you learn some more I mean you're still climbing yep. even though you're not always crushing it but you're always improving always moving forward I think um, that's all- one of the most common themes when I talk to people who I consider to be very established and very successful in in their careers is the coaching never stops either, right? That's right. the other thing, yeah. right? You never get to a point where you're like, okay, I'm done now. There's always something new to learn. There's always a new trend on the horizon that you have to adapt for. Even the most successful talent can get comfortable and settled in their ways. And so they've got to learn something new to adapt and, you know, maybe break out of a creative rut or whatever. And so now it, it's kind of come full circle for you because now you are teaching as well. 
and doing yeah. a great job of helping voice actors to to really level up what they're doing. So I, I want to talk to you about audition strategy because I know sure. that that's something that you're really, really good at. So let's talk about online casting and what does auditioning on online casting look like for you at the most basic level? Are you, are you selective? Is there some sort of methodical approach? Do you do you have like a five minute timer that you set for yourself to get in, get get the audition submitted, be done with it? What what is your kind of general strategy when you're coming to online auditions? Yes, all of what you just said. All of those things. Yeah. Everything no, all at once. <laughs> um it's it's funny. The online casting approach at its core is no different from anything else that you're doing for your agents or things that you mine on your own. Um, it boils down to being the exact perfect who you are, following the spec and giving this natural, beautiful read. Um, that somebody's going to listen to and shortlist you because you got to get shortlisted to get hired. You know, right. you don't just you don't you don't just throw something out and into the world and and it luckily lands somewhere. Um, casting sites for me and I, my coaching that I do and the things that I help people with is just for whatever reason I love connecting with people on Zoom and even before the pandemic started, every person that hired me or wanted to hire me or said, "Hey, your voice sounded great. Can you give me a sample?" I found a way to get them on a Zoom, and I learned from them through that process what they did in in casting, especially online casting, and what they didn't like, what they liked, and what I was doing that happened to work well for them. And that's what I keep refining for myself. And when people work with me one on one, I share that those little those little secret things that I have that really that really do work. But what it boils down to is online casting is. You have to send out perfect broadcast quality, exact what they want snippets and one after another. I, I tell people it's like I'm playing darts by myself and every one of my auditions is a, a little platinum tip dart and it's a bullseye. Boom, boom, boom. And when I have a day when I'm auditioning and I'm using casting sites and my agents that come in are part of that, returning customer stuff, but every one is is perfect and I know it's bookable and the best I can be, but then I forget about it. You know, you get a lot of them out there and they're all perfect. And the ones that want me will hire me. And the difference is the speed, like for casting sites, I have my process down to on average, you know, four to five minutes, start to finish, open the opportunity, read the script, read the directions um, twice, look at the script, choose what I'm going to voice, do it, edit. And then before I hit send, I read the direction a third time to make sure I didn't say, you know, sometimes it says no announcer or you're salesy most of the time. But then once in a while you get one that says, we want the big announcer guy. And I didn't read the fact. And so I got to go back and do it again. Right. Uh, but I'm always careful about that. And I think that's, you know, uh, I think it's really easy to to overthink yeah. that that whole entire process. I liked something I had Karen Guilfrey on the show uh, several she is months a queen, ago, by the way, Karen is a queen, and, and she reminded me of not that long ago. You know, pre-COVID, if you were in a major set, uh, major center, like you know, I'm relatively close to Toronto. I used to get called into audition for right. a lot of stuff for my agent, and you don't have the luxury of spending 45 minutes on an audition when you're when you're going into the studio and recording oh. live, and so it really forces you to just look at the script, give it your best shot. You don't have time to overthink it because mm -hmm. they've got 25 other people in the lobby that are waiting to submit. And when you think about it from that perspective, it, it really does make a case for, you know, get these auditions submitted quickly. And it's not that you're trying to just cram in as many as humanly possible with as little care and thought as possible exactly. as much as it is. You're trying to keep yourself from overthinking it because chances are, if you spend 45 minutes on it, by the time you get to the 75th take, the, the first or second one was still the best one. Yeah. And people, when I'm, I require homework for people that work with me. Mm -hmm. And that when they send me stuff the first time and they're not booking a lot of work yet, I'll listen and I'm going, uh, and I'm, we're t I'm just chatting with them and I'm saying, yeah, on this one, did you maybe voice half of this and then leave and come back and voice the middle part again? Because you can hear the mic proximity changes, the attitude changes, the brightness right. changes, and you got to get people out of that overthinking everything. And you just, you get, when you ignore your equipment, if you have great equipment in a great space and you ignore it, 
you can just be who you are. And that makes the editing almost almost like you don't have to edit. Yeah. It's just there it is. And it's boom, off it goes. Another one, off it goes. And back to Karn, she I've talked to her many times, and I think she truly is a voiceover queen. She's amazing. And we were chatting one time before one of the conferences because my what I teach and what I believe in mirrors what she says so much that I just wanted to talk to her about it. And she said the most brilliant thing because we both agreed that we love to audition. We love to work. We love to make a ton of money. But we love auditioning. We love the process. And she said, Brad, for me, auditioning is my conditioning. And booking the job, that's my game. Right. But then you just think of all the people who treasure coaching and practice and people like Tiger Woods or name any top golfer, they always have their coach with them and they're always working on their swing and putting and everything. So yeah, it's a, it's an art, but I happen to love that side of the business. So, and I think that that's something, I think that's a mindset that a lot of voice actors don't have. I think a lot of voice actors see auditioning as this annoying thing that they have to do yeah. to get to the payday. And I think when you come from that perspective or come from that mindset, it actually influences and, and impacts the quality of your audition, right? You should see that audition as, as the job. This is, this is the job to, to get the job. And so it's an important distinction to make. Video is such a big part of social media, and we see that on every single one of the platforms. Instagram used to be a photo sharing app. Now it's primarily about video. Facebook gives preference in the algorithm to video. LinkedIn gives preference in the algorithm to video. TikTok is one of the fastest growing social media platforms that exist. YouTube is pushing shorts and putting even more emphasis on that type of video content. If you are going to use social media for your voiceover business in today's landscape, you're going to have to embrace video. But if you're not sure where to start with video, I want to help you. I've created a free resource that you can download called 20 Video Ideas for Instagram and TikTok. And that's exactly what it is. It is just a simple guide that is going to inspire you to unique types of video content that you can create that would work across really any of the social media platforms. You can download this free resource now by going to markscottcoaching.com forward slash 20 video ideas. And that's the number 220. markscottcoaching.com forward slash 20 video ideas. Now back to our show. Now you touched on this a little bit. We've, we've talked a little bit about the fact that we, you know, voice actors tend to overthink their auditions too much. You've coached enough talent now. I'm curious to hear what your take is on this. Why, why, why are we overthinking it so much? Do you see common themes that are, that are holding talent back or? I, I do. And I, and especially for new people, and even for some for some experienced people, they sort of get in a rut, and sometimes it's just because they have their headset on when they're their headphones on when they're recording, and they're amplifying every little mistake into their brain, and you completely take out of the, you know the natural thing. So I never let anybody use headset when they're coaching with me. You always use them to edit, but never to do the actual voicing job. Um, I think it. People just have to get into a place, like I said before, where you trust everything else. You have a great space, and it doesn't matter how it looks. If it's a great sound, whether it's a bedroom or a corner in the basement that you've secluded and walled off and insulated, if you trust your space and your sound floor and your equipment and your, you have your mic in the right spot and you trust it and the, the doll you're working with, you understand and know how to use it, that's why I send people to Uncle Roy to get, you know, help with the technical side. Because yep. if you trust your space, the technical side should be like this. Boom, 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 without any thought. When people overthink it and they overlisten and they're hypercritical about every little thing, it's because they're not trusting the whole process. And once they do and you get some confidence and you, you can realize, oh, I can open this up. I can find a spot of this script that I'm going to voice. Not the whole thing, but the little little section. And I can do this twice and I can follow the direction, but give two separate reads that are vastly different, but not crazy different. And when, when the voice buyers hear that, it's like, oh, I love this voice, number one. Sound is good. I love that they gave me two samples that are different. They really are different for the first time. Thank you. You know, and those all lead to the voice buyer going shortlist 
And then you're down to from 150, it's down to you and three or four or five other people. I think it's really important that you're highlighting this, the, the, the audio side of things. One of the things that I learned from having the opportunity to interview CEOs from a number of the different casting sites was how key good quality sound is. Yeah. And you may deliver the absolute perfect performance, but if the quality of the audio of your audition stinks, you are probably getting overlooked. And, and so I, yeah. it is one of those things that, you know, if, if you have any doubts or at all about your studio, which like you said, you know, you're listening in your headphones and you're trying to make sure it all sounds perfect or whatever. It is absolutely worth working with somebody like Uncle Roy, George Whittem, Dan Leonard, Jordan yep. Reynolds, whoever, yep. have them give you that extra vote of confidence that says, no, your sound is good. So now you don't ever have to think about that. And you know that that is never going to take you out of the running. And so now you can just focus completely on your performance, which is so, so key. And the, and the four guys you just rattled off are the ones that I also, you know, it's, and there's lots of other people that are good at tech and helping set up. It's getting to the point where you just know what you've got is, is good. And then you can just focus on the performance part. And the next level of the performance part is remembering it's not a performance. You're delivering a story even yeah. if it's a 15 second or 20 second, there's a story and a message in a script. You have to snuggle up to that and let yourself share that with yourself first and then with the listener and be completely who you are, not who you think somebody else wants you to sound like. And that's yeah. what so many people I work with, you know, they'll be just talking like this and this is how they sound. And then when they go to voice for me, it's like, they go right to like something like this. And it's like, <laughs> that just doesn't, you yep. know, one in a 50 will be, hey, we want a big announcer guy on this. And you can, you can be. One in 50? Still, really? You think the odds no, are still that good? No, no, no. I, I'm, one in 5,000? <laughs> one, in, one in a thousand. Um, <laughs> where, and I like, I do a hymns.com spot and it's, it's a radio spot that I still hear sometimes. And it's, it's so over the top. It's embarrassing, but it's like, he's so cool. He makes cucumbers nervous. His hobbies include working on engines for NASA, you know. And it's just way over the top silly, but geez, once in a while you get a chance to Every do once that. in a while you get to do that. It's fun. Yeah. You know, it's funny you talk about the headphone thing because I know this is a conversation. Uncle Roy and I have had this argument a thousand times because I'm a recovering radio guy. And so obviously for anybody who worked in radio, you got used to wearing headphones all the time. You couldn't go on the air without your headphones on because right. you had to hear what was going on. And so now, even 10 years off the air, it's still, it's almost like a, I don't know. I feel like Linus from from the Peanuts cartoons with my blanket. Like it's almost like my headphones are like my blanket or something because it has 20 years of radio that that's a hard habit to to get over. But admittedly, in the last few months, I have been trying to be a little bit better about doing some auditioning without headphones just to see if I can get comfortable with it and to see for myself, is there a, a noticeable difference in my reads? And And I will admit as much as I hate to admit it, and I hope <laughs> Uncle Roy's not listening to this episode. Oh, I'm going to tell him. Every once in a while, I will notice a difference between headphones and, and no headphones and how that, how that comes across and how my voice comes across. And I definitely know that when I need to do something that is a little bit, a little bit more laid back, a little bit more subdued, a little bit more calm or something like that, especially on those types of auditions, not having the headphones on, it really does make a difference. And it's something that you wouldn't think about but it really is key. And it's a fun, it's, it's fun to talk to different coaches about their take on it because everybody, headphones is one of those things that people have strong opinions about. Oh yeah. And I've, I've, I've only had one person that said, no, no, I'm going to keep them on. That's yeah. how I do it. And I'm like, all right, I'll draw another battle with you somewhere else down the line. But <laughs> um, so much of what I help people with is recognizing the value of the physicality, the real physicality of sounding real. So right. if I'm putting my headphones on, because Mark and I can see each other, but you can just, all the audience can only hear us. But if you have your headphones on, it, you, it completely takes you out of the realness and the, the connection with the air that's around you. Yep. And it hyper accentuates every little tick and mouth bubble and yes. pop and mistake. Yep. And all, the other thing is with physicality, even if it's just a simple line, like, I don't know, Bob, maybe we should talk about that tomorrow. Okay. Blah, blah, blah. When you add the physicality of like, I don't know, Bob, you know, and you're, you, you, you don't, can't scratch your head because it'll make a sound, but 
the things you do with your eyebrows and your ears and your the, your scalp and your shoulders and your hands when you're doing a list and things, those all create that real sound. So that's why I, you know, back to your thing about trusting your space and being real yep. and the physicality that lets, lets you get there. One of the things that I've also started playing around with a little bit, and, and I do this particularly on some of my e-learning, because once upon a time, e-learning was my safe space because, <laughs> because you didn't have to really be able to act. You just had to be able to read and you could just go in and read and, and, and away you go. And now that e-learning is even being written more conversationally and, and yeah. they're starting to ask for, you know, it's something I got to I got to work a little bit harder at. There are actually some scripts that I have gone into the booth and I will I will sit in my chair, but I will recline it back. Mm -hmm. And I'll just bring the microphone towards me and I'll literally sit in the booth, recline back with my feet up or something like that. Yeah. And just putting myself in that position. That physicality, that yeah. real physicality of the moment that you're in. And it's yep. so it's it's perfect example of of and that's why when I'm doing if I'm doing like a uh, a character voice for some battle game, I'll I, I swing my mic to the right here and I get my music stand out and I run my logic on my cell phone, you know, the remote that I can run my, my DAW on. And that way I can jump and move my arms and die and yell and all those things without, you know, you can't, that you can't do while you're sitting down as yeah. much. Yep. It's, it's, it's an interesting thing. It's, uh, it, I mean, for years, I just sat in a chair and recorded and that was it. That was how I did it because again, radio, right? That's what you do when you're on the radio. You can't be moving around the booth or running <laughs> around the studio or whatever. And so now that I have a, a little bit more space to work with, you know, sometimes I stand, sometimes my arms move, sometimes my hands are in my pockets, sometimes they're up beside me, sometimes I'm sitting in a chair and I'm relaxed or reclined or whatever. And, and you know, all these different things, these little, these little things that I would probably otherwise feel stupid about, but they're all little things that help one, bring out better reads. And one of my little tips that I share with my students, I'll share it here, is um, record at the speed of life, voice yeah. at the speed of life. And that's something... I think I made that up. If somebody finds it somewhere and you, you say I stole it, it's because I think I made it up. But and that applies to whatever that is. So if you're if you're voicing something and you're an HR person, and you're having this conversation, you want to you want to have that same feeling, that same speed of what's going on. And if you're an excited dad whose kids are climbing on the chandelier for a for a Lowe's commercial or something, it's like, no, honey, don't do that. No, no, no. You know, and you got to be able to have that. In yep. your in your studio space, you can't yep. just you can't be a deer in the headlights, dead still, and try to recreate real sounds. You have Absolutely. to be real. Yeah. All right. So let's talk some more casting site specific strategy. Sure. Do you spend any time at all when an audition comes in looking at oh this one's already had so many submissions or this one's already you know been posted for twenty four hours or whatever and and do you rule stuff out like that? Or are you yeah. just, are you submitting for what fits you regardless and, and hoping for the best? Well, it's both of those. Um, if the luxury of being full time, when you're on an audition day, when something comes in and it's hot, you jump on it. Right. You know, even if I'm voicing a project and it's not due until the next day, I'll put that aside and I will jump on some hot auditions. And that's that's what the beginners or the new people or the non full time people are their biggest battle is they're they are in the same pond with me and you and Jay Michael and Karn yep. Guilford and all those other I'm, I put myself in the same level as you and me and Jay Mike uh, you and Jay Michael and Karn did you see how I did that anytime I'm that I can be associated in the same yeah. sentence as you three I feel like I'm winning so. right I, I I put myself at that level and I'm not saying that I'm that level but. On a whole, all of us fish that are full time making a great living at voiceover, we're in that ocean and that pond and we're hungry and we're eating all the time. So the people that are part time and they finish their job and then they come home sleepy at 530 and they have dinner and then they're going to get in the studio. That's great. And people have to do that. But you just have to remember that all the rest of us sharks have been chewing on that since eight o'clock in the morning. It's interesting that you bring that up because I think that's one of the biggest discouraging factors for, for voice actors who are part time. Mm -hmm. trying to use online casting is is there's this def, def, this feeling of defeat before they even start yeah because maybe they don't get into this, the booth until six o'clock or seven o'clock at night and so many of those auditions have already got x number submitted or or whatever yep. and so it's really easy right out of the gate to start feeling like why even bother this is a complete waste yeah, of time I, but there's also something to be said for just getting in your reps right yeah, I mean, I would ne I would I do not like people using casting sites as practice you yeah. Know? 
They haven't coached enough. They don't have great demos. And they're just going to jump on Voices.com and throw a bunch of crap out there and hope something sticks. That's not the way you should do it. No, because those are still actual jobs. You don't want to yeah. waste the time of the of the person who's trying to yeah, hire. Yeah, and it, even if it does, someone would say, well, I don't care. It's good for me. Well, that's true. But you got to get all the things lined up, get your train on the track and the engine in front and the caboose in the back and all the pieces on it. And then you move out to be successful. But I'm on a number of casting sites. And I see stuff come in all the time. Yep. You know, I, I'll be eating dinner sometime and I'm not one of these people that go, oh my gosh, and put my plate aside and, you know, stop visiting with my wife because a good opportunity comes in. But I will see it come in and I'll go, <laughs> I'll go, oh, there's a good one on, on one, two, three. It's, it's like uh, two grand for um, an explainer video. So I'm going to hop in a studio when I'm done dinner and I'm going to do it. And I do. And when I'm in there, I often will go to work late in the afternoon or early evening, and lots of opportunities are pouring in. And I'll just chew on them while they're there. And it's, I mean, and plus, you know, there's a whole casting site discussion about the levels, like on one, two, three, that we don't have time to get into. But, <laughs> but if we don't have time to get into it because I think we could talk about it for three hours and still not fully understand how yeah, it works. Yeah, and it's and it's not fair, and it's and it's bad, but it's you know. It is I'm one of the people is. that are using it for my own benefit because I'm a, I'm a platinum on that yep. that platform. Well, and then you have a site like Bidalgo, who the auditions get submitted to the voice seeker in the reverse order. So to try to make it more fair and diplomatic, right? So if you're the first person to submit for that job, you may actually be the last person well, that the buyer hears. And so well, there's yes all kinds no. of different things that come into play. Yeah. Yes and no, meaning you'll show up in the reverse order. Right. But if somebody puts a casting out there and they go look and you were the first one, they're going to see you and listen to you. Yeah. So they have access to see all that stuff as soon as it comes in. So there's still a benefit to being early in Bidalgo. It's Certainly. Just if, if you get to it, if you get to it after 50 people, yeah, you are going to be at the top of the list, but that doesn't mean that the voice buyer hasn't already looked at that list four times that day. It's just one of those things where I don't... I, I don't like when I hear voice actors who feel like it, it's not even worth it, at which point right. you're carrying that into your audition, right? Yeah, exactly. If that's the mentality that you're bringing into the booth, like, oh, this is a waste of time. 50 people have already submitted. Then you know what? Maybe don't submit because you're just yeah. that's just going to come through in your read. Yep. But if you just take it as, look, this is an opportunity. It fits my specs. Who knows? Because there are buyers who, if they ask for 50, they listen to 50. Yep. And so you still do have a realistic shot. Now, another thing that gets debated a lot with online casting is budgets. So talk to me about your approach to budget ranges. Are you splitting the difference? Are you bidding high? Do you just quote your rate regardless of what the budget is? What, what kind of strategy do you use and what kind of strategy do you suggest for budget ranges on online I think casting? everybody... Everybody has to run their own business, and it has to be unique to them and their plan. But that that doesn't mean do stuff for cheap or for free right. or get abused by the industry by doing in perpetuity crap for two hundred dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, for me, I have a studio minimum that all my non broadcast stuff, you know, has to be at least here. Mm -hmm. um, and if somebody ha if somebody invites me to a job like on Voice One Two Three, I'll get. I, I'll, some days I'll get three or four or five direct invites and they say, and sometimes those, those budgets, it'll be like, Brad, your voice is perfect for this. We're a marching band and we want a very deep, your voice was great. We picked you. This just happened yesterday. We picked you out of um, 13 or, or 15 voices. You're the best one for this. But um, you said that your rate is a little higher. What is it? They said their budget was $200. And I said, no. For non-broadcast single-use thing, I need I need three fifty, and if you're going to have a directed session, I need to add my session fee into that. And they're like, "Oh my gosh!" And I said, "Well, we can talk. You want to have a quick Zoom, and you can tell me about why this is so important for you, and maybe I'll want to help you." Out. I, I just always leave the room, I always leave the door open to negotiate, no matter what. Yep. And if somebody invites me to a job, and they're new, and they say, "We want you to be the voice of this. It's really great." And our budget is fifty dollars. I don't send them a note saying, "Get out of the pool, you're a dumbass." Uh, I'm way too important for you. I always send them a note that says, "Man, thanks so much for including me. This doesn't match my non-broadcast minimum, 
if you want to chat, I'd love to talk to you and I can share the rate guide information with you. Uh, or if you have some room in your budget, maybe we can negotiate something that's a little bit okay for you. And a lot of times people say, yeah, what is that number? What do I need to be at? I think that is so important because I think that's another area where I see a lot of voice actors dropping the ball. They get a low ball offer from a voice seeker and they, they take it personal almost like, like they take it like it's an insult when in reality, maybe that buyer genuinely doesn't know. Maybe they generally, they genuinely have no idea about voiceover rates. And so I feel like, you know, one of the examples that I've given is, is I don't have any clue what the going rate is for getting my toilet fixed. And so when I call a plumber, I hope that he is going to be a kind enough, good enough person that he's going to explain to me the rate and the cost for getting a toilet fixed, Yeah, that he's not going to get annoyed for me being so stupid that I don't automatically know this number. But that's what I feel like so many voice actors do. They get annoyed and frustrated. And every day there's another well, 20 different complaints in a group about, you know, yeah, this rate and all that. There's a lot of group think, group hate yes. when it comes to casting sites. Yeah. And um, and I I don't, I mean, I don't take part in those pig piles where somebody's, you know, making fun or why are you asking yep. that question? Are you stupid? Um, everybody's business is their own, but um, voice buyers are not always that smart. And sometimes even on voices.com or something, the voice person will, the voice buyer will, We'll put a rate in there, and they're just clicking boxes. Yep. And they see a box to click. Yep. Um, in perpetuity. Oh, that sounds important. Yeah, yep. I guess I need that. That's a fancy word. Yeah. National broadcast um, for whatever I want to use it for. Yeah, click that. And all it is sometimes is just, hey, did you know that that's not really going to fit with most professional voice actors? And then they, oh, what do you mean? Well, here's the here's the GVA price guy. And if you want to walk it through, I'll help you look at it. And, and you just – I always try to – that I've heard Jay Michaels, Colin say this a million times, and anyone, a lot of other people says, just don't be a dick. Yes. You, know? yes. you can run your business and you can have opinions, but if somebody posts something or somebody says something that they're using, like, hey, I just booked my first thing on voices.com and I made $150. Don't be the person, to, the first one to say, well, you're an, you're an asshat because you shouldn't be using voices.com. Uh, you should be smarter than that. And that's minimal $400. So you're cheating us all by, by letting, you know, there's just so much room for discussion and learning and helping customers understand. Yeah. And that's where I am. I am in the same boat. I, I've said the same thing all along. I, part of my job, if I can't have the decency and the patience to help a buyer understand where my numbers come from, then that's a me problem, not, not yeah. a buyer problem. And so yeah. I'm always willing to have that conversation. So, okay. For me, once upon a time, I was on multiple casting sites and, and I, I developed what I call the pay to play mentality where it's really easy when you've got, you know, maybe you're on voices and you're on one, two, three, and you're on Bidalgo and you're on VO planet or whatever else is out there. And you're constantly getting inundated with audition opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I'd be like standing in line at the grocery store and six really sweet auditions would come in while I was standing in line at the grocery store. And by the time I got home, all six of those jobs were already filled. And so now I'm ticked that I missed out on all these amazing opportunities and I never want to go to the grocery store again, right? And it starts to mess with your head or it can start to mess with your head. Yeah. So you've got multiple online casting profiles. What do you do to help you find that balance of still being able to get really great opportunities? But like you said, you still sit down and have dinner with your wife and you don't sweat it if something comes in while, while you're doing that. How do you find that balance and, and what do you suggest for us? Um, I think number one is if you're, it's just like a gym membership. And I know you've used this, uh, you and I have both used this metaphor. Before. I've never used a gym membership. No, I'm saying, <laughs> I'm, well, clearly by looking at it. No, I'm uh, um, but people that say, oh, it, that gym is so expensive. It's what a, what, a, that's so dumb. Who would, who would spend $40 a month for a gym membership? Well, guess what? If you spend $40 a month and you go three or four times, and you become super healthy and happy and your life improves because you got endorphin. It's the best money you could spend. It's the same thing with a casting site in that if you're using a casting site, you have to maximize your profile yeah. and you have to make sure you everything on your profile is the way it should be. That's why I recommend people use the voice123pros.com yep. and talk to Natasha. And actually I have a, 
if people want to message me, I have um, a discount code that Natasha gave me. And if they email me, I'll give, a, give them that discount code. But spool up your one, two, three profile, and whatever you do there, that same mentality matches for voices or anything else so that you, everything that people see is really great stuff. Yep. And, and you've done all the keywording properly. And you get, I, some people will come tell me, yeah, I don't get anything. I'm so pissed. I'm going to stop using voice one, two, three. And then I go into their profile and I open and they've got three samples, like three demos, nothing broken out, nothing tagged properly with the space line, space, all the, the metrics. And it's like, well, that's why when you have everything geared up, the system works for you better, you know? Right. Yep. But the other thing on one, two, three is just so I can say it, don't join one, two, three and join at 888 or 1200, whatever, and then audition your face off. If you're not really good, because if you do 50 auditions and don't get liked, their algorithm is going to go. Yeah, you're dinked. Yep. You're going to, and you're going to get squashed. And then you're going to be one of those people saying, casting sites suck, voice one, two, three sucks. And anyone that uses casting sites is stupid. And that's yep. completely not true. Yep. Absolutely. I know for me, one of the things that I ultimately had to do was I, I limited the auditions that I saw. And so a lot of casting sites will give you the ability to set a bottom line, right? I don't want to see any yeah. audition under X dollar value. Yeah. So that immediately takes off some of the pressure. And sure. I'm also one of those guys that knows I have lanes, right? I'm not an audiobook guy, so I don't no. need to see audiobook auditions. Yep. Same I'm, here. I'm not a character guy, never will be a character guy. So I don't need to see those auditions. But you're so, such a great Eeyore. So you, that's, that's, that's what Bridget says. But <laughs> so you can turn on certain genres or turn off certain genres, which limits the number of auditions that you see. And that, yeah. that can help a little bit. Uh, but also knowing that, look, there are going to be opportunities that are come that you're going to miss and, and that's okay. You'll get a whole new fresh batch of opportunities tomorrow. Yeah. So, just delete. I, yeah. I don't even worry about responding. Just delete them. If I'm not going to do them, just delete. And you can also set, you can set your, on, uh, on some of them, I have my minimum low enough so that local car ads will come through because local car ads for you know, for a, um, a three week run for a, you know, a Honda dealership, it's not going to be thousands of dollars. It's going to be hundreds of dollars. But yep. the thing is it comes back. Yep. So if, if you, if you accept a $250 or $350 job and you do it, chances are the price is going to change and there's going to be a new car and they got it by yep. law, they have to do a new, new ad. So they're not giving the wrong price. Absolutely. So I know another thing that a lot of voice actors struggle with is two takes. So you go to this audition, it's got really great directions, very thorough. And so you go into the booth, you record that, that audition following those directions and you like, I nailed it, but now you got to do a second take. How in the world do you do a second take? Well, what, 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 what is your strategy for approaching that when you feel like you followed the specs completely? Do you just go off book and deliver uniquely Brad? Do you? Do you deliver something that's so far out there that it makes the first one sound even better? What, what, how do you come up with, with take Number, two? Well, first of all, I never do a take two unless I feel a reason for a take two. Okay. And I, have a, I, I can give them something that is completely different while still following the spec. Or they've said, we want two takes and make the second one this or this or this. And right. then you do that. So many times I see people agonizing and they send me homeworks and they'll send two takes. I will stack them, you know, I'm, I'm a little sneaky. I'll stack them and I'll set the timer. I, I mean, I will edit them so they land in the exact, and when you play them, it's like an echo chamber. They are, they are exactly the same read. And the people who did them, they're like, oh my gosh, is that my second read? Yeah, it's exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And I don't do that to be mean to people. I just, when you're, when you're doing, don't do it unless there's a reason. And if there's a reason, have a plan for what you're going to do. I, here's a trick I often do is sometimes a script will be just a normal, straight, uh, non-broadcast narration. And I'll just use my business, quote unquote, business style. Right. Which is just kind of like the way I'm talking to you here. You're going to come down to this place and we have everything you need and come into the back, park near the door, blah, blah, blah. That's business. But then I will give them a business friendly which is that same voice, but it's got way more smile and way more more sort of lightness to it. And they're different. They're way different, but they're still the same script. I think that's, honestly, that's one of the hardest things sometimes. And I know, like, I, I've got an agent. Almost every single audition is give us two takes. They give us very specific and strict directions to follow, 
but it also says, please submit two takes. And I'm like, I sit in the booth sometimes and I'm like, but why? <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and so it, it does become a frustration. And so trying to come up with what does take two sound like? And usually and, for me, it's like, let's do something that just makes take one sound better. <laughs> yeah, well, that's yeah. And that that's a little bit of a mistake. And I, I'm, a lot of people feel the same way. But other people, they think two takes is the second take is different because they they change the inflection on the first sentence. Yep. You know, they, they inflect up or they inflect down. Yep. And that's different. Well, it's not about changing inflection on one word. And it's not about having a longer pause because it's it's about a different feel a different emotion and finding what can be different and delivering it naturally it they come it's different yep. it's just different you know yep so we've talked about different casting sites we've talked about bidding we've talked about how quickly we should be submitting not overthinking all of these different things any other golden nuggets for us for submitting online casting auditions that might help us set ourselves apart or get that extra booking this week? I have a couple that I reserve <laughs> for my my students, my one-on-one -on -one students, because they really are sort of the boiling down top pieces of advice. And I'm not, it's not an advertisement because I, I don't have the bandwidth to just start being a coach. I like, I, my spot is in my studio right here voicing for my customers. And I add the coaching because I just love to do it. And I connect with the people that I, it's like a fault. I connect with them and I love them. Yep. And and I just get so committed to their success that it's almost like, it's like, I don't know, it's a very emotional thing for me. Sure. Um, Which makes you a good coach. Well, I appreciate that. I, I think, I think the secret is center yourself in your booth, in your recording space. And if, that, if you got to do that, close your eyes and breathe through your nose and out your mouth for a minute, thinking about where this, is, where this story is and where you want it to be. And get to the point where you can just be yourself and don't try to be the sound that you think other people want you to be. Because I hear so many times people are voicing things and they have these great, unique, connective voices that they use when they're talking to you. And they get into their booth and they add a, a pulse to it or a beat or a, um, a you know, a, where everything sounds kind of the same. You're going to voice like this and everything's going to end down and you're going to end it down because that's just what they're in their head. You just have to find find somebody who can get you out of thinking that you got to sound like something that, that other people want you to sound like. You just got to be yourself. The idea of taking a breath, I think, is so key because the reality is for most of us. We're doing online casting. We're in a hurry because we feel like it's a race, right? It's a race to be the first five that submit or the first 10 that submit. And so you go into the booth, whether you realize it or not, in a hurry. I got to get this done so I could get it submitted before 25 other voice actors submit ahead of me. And then you can sound rushed. And yeah. so to go in and just take that beat, give yourself that that minute to just like you said, center and, and find your spot. I love and when, that. And when you, when you trust your space, you know you have a good floor and it doesn't matter what your space looks like. If the sound is good and your chain is good and your mic is in the right spot, it's easier for you to just find, this, find your center and be yourself without trying to put too many levels, without putting too much polish or sugar or, you know, inflection. Just you got to be yourself to start with. And then massage that and paint yourself a little bit based on where the story is going. Absolutely. Well, Brian, I know that you share some really helpful stuff on some of your social media profiles. You're always making videos and cool tips from the booth <laughs> and all that sort of stuff. So if somebody wants to find you on social media, maybe pick up some of those tips, watch some of those videos, where do we need to look for you? Uh, you can, well, my website is just AmericanVoicePower.com. My email is brad at AmericanVoicePower.com. And my Instagram is just at here Brad Highland, H-E-A-R Brad Highland. Um, and, and if you follow me, I'll follow you back. So I will link all of that up in the show notes. Now, I know you said that you've got a limited bandwidth for coaching because, you know, your happy place is in the booth recording for your customers. But the reality is there's probably going to be some people that are going to want to inquire with you about <laughs> some coaching. So if somebody wants to do that, is it just sending an email or do you have a, a process that you go through? How does that work? My 
I would I'm even if I can't take you on for a week or two or whatever, I still want to connect with you. And every person that I coach with, I start with a free Zoom chat. And sometimes those chats are 20 minutes long because for me, that relationship and that trust has to be there before before you will take anything and make it work. So I'll just line people up and and get those first chats done and then put put them in the queue and I I don't want to do more than one or two coaching sessions a day with all the rest of the stuff that I'm doing but I've I never thought 7 years ago when I started this full time after 35 years in business that I was going to dearly love and be moved by coaching people and helping them as much as I do. Yeah. I feel that because I certainly had zero intentions of ever setting out to do any coaching, but it was one of those things where I guess the market dictated it, right? You yeah. get to a point where people start reaching out to you and then you realize, wow, you know, I've been doing this for a while and maybe I do have something to offer or I do have something to say or whatever. And, and, uh, and then you just kind of follow that wherever it goes. So I, I love that. And I know that you're legit and I know that you genuinely care. And I know that the voice actors from talking to voice actors who have worked with you, I know that you're making a big difference on them as well. And so I, really, I, appreciate I appreciate you for, for doing that. So I'm grateful to you for that. And, and thank you for the, everything that you've shared today to, to try and help us get a little bit better with our auditioning and to have that different mentality when approaching the auditioning, not seeing that as like this nuisance step to get to the end goal and get to the check, but this is the job and, and love it. Yeah, it is the job. Well, I appreciate it. I know you're doing lots of great stuff, Mark, and it's an honor to be on with you. So much great advice from Brad in this episode, and I hope that you were taking notes because so many of the things that he said, it will help you to be a better auditioner, not just to get better results from your online casting, which I believe these tips are going to help you do that, but just auditioning in general, whether you're submitting an audition for an agent or submitting an audition for a client or submitting an audition that's come as a result of your direct marketing. All of these tips are going to help you get better. And if you can be a better auditioner, you are going to grow your business. I hope you've been inspired and encouraged by this episode. And if you find this podcast helpful, would you please leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening? It would mean a lot to me and it will certainly help other people to find the podcast as well. Thanks so much for listening and I'll catch you on the next one. The Everyday Vopreneur Podcast. Available everywhere fine podcasts are given away for free. Mostly, we think. Having your voiceover demos easily playable and downloadable on your website is essential. The Voice Sam Player lets you do that across any device and browser. There are also options for adding play buttons in your email signature, tracking your listens, and even putting videos in your demo player. Sign up now at voicesam.com/markscott and receive an instant $25 credit. For full details and to claim this offer, visit voicesam.com/markscott. And see. And that's a wrap. Thanks for hanging in. Thanks for hanging out. Want more Vopreneur goodness? Jump online at vopreneur.com.